Greetings. I'm going to tell you a story using four charts and four seemingly unrelated charts. And my narrative is going to weave together a picture that is greater than the sum of the parts. Because while this is a subject we have spoken about previously on this channel, namely e-commerce replacing brick and mortar retail sales and the real estate implications of a vast shuttering of retail real estate, the data that is emerging around this is pretty interesting and another gale of creative destruction is on the horizon from this. It's partly already underway, but the bigger impacts of this are yet to come and very few people are prepared for this, particularly those who own a certain type of real estate. So here from the Federal Reserve Bureau of St. Louis, we have a chart that reveals what percentage of U.S. retail sales comprise of e-commerce. So back in 2000 and late 1999, when less than 1% of U.S. retail sales were e-commerce, that was when we had a dot-com bubble and all those dot-com companies achieving stratospheric valuations for the time and going bust. But the e-commerce trend never abated. Even during this dot-com bust, this shaded area indicates a recession and that was the dot-com bust, the percentage of retail sales that was e-commerce did not go backwards it continued to rise along a very smooth trend line and kept on rising, kept on rising, an exponential parabola. And then the COVID-19 crisis hit and a lot of retail outlets could not receive shoppers due to quarantine. So there was more buying over e-commerce and that caused this spike. Once COVID got under control and quarantines ended and people returned to shopping in brick and mortar retail stores, that spike abated. But guess what? we returned back to this trend line. So if COVID had never happened, this segment would be joined with this segment. It would still just be a smooth, exponentially rising curve. Now, this is not a curve that goes to infinity, of course. Eventually, e-commerce as a percentage of all retail sales might start to flatline in the 40 or 50 percent zone because there are certain things people will still buy from brick and mortar retail. But this steady curve shows some of the first principles of technological disruption that we always talk about, how it's always a steady exponential trend. And now at 15 percent of all retail sales in the U.S. being e-commerce, that has a lot of implications. By 2024, I would not be surprised if this is approaching 20 percent. That indicates a major shift towards the dematerialized nature of e-commerce. And the key to understanding the economics of technological disruption is to see how many seemingly unrelated trends are in fact interconnected. So when I mentioned the four charts that I was going to show you over the course of this video, these are charts that have appeared elsewhere on this channel in videos of entirely different subjects, but they still connect to this topic. So now we go to a chart that reveals how much land the United States has devoted to the retail shopper. Now see this chart from The Economist and their source is Morgan Stanley. The United States devotes twice as much land to retail shoppers as Australia, a very thinly populated country, and about six times as much land as Britain, France, and Japan. So when retail sales go to e-commerce in the United States, the amount of retail land that has to be repurposed is much, much more. Retail is in fact very uncompetitive relative to e-commerce in the United States because of this large overhead. And the most extreme is California, where you see huge strip malls that are empty and you have to include their parking lots, acres and acres of parking lots that are empty. The retail malls are empty. Yet within walking distance of there, we are to believe that a townhouse on a narrow footprint of land is worth $1.7 million or $1.8 million. So a tiny footprint of land is built very vertically high. And that structure is worth $1.8 million, even though the walls are common with the neighbors and things like that. And yet all this retail land is just empty and unused. And in California, there is a very, very pernicious and anti-progress NIMBY coalition that tries to prevent all types of new construction from ever occurring. And some of them are driven by creating scarcity so that the houses they own stay expensive. Some of them are just racist. They don't want anyone who is kind of a new demographic coming into their place, even if the new demographic, in fact, makes more than they do. But there's combinations of that. So the United States devotes six times as much land to retail. And this is, again, a byproduct of a provision in the tax code from 1954, where there was accelerated depreciation on this type of construction and zoning favored retail land. 
and created a suburbia mindset, which is not suitable for California, where there is ultra expensive real estate and ultimately not suited for any part of the United States because it's just a waste of land in the face of e-commerce. And so now you have a distortion that is only coming due because of something in the tax code from 1954. It created distortion and now we are seeing the end of this 68 plus years later as this unfolds. And almost no one can actually trace the problem to its correct origin because they're not looking at the megatrends. They are too attached to the status quo thinking that that is permanent. When a provision in the tax code from 1954 over incentivizes the overbuilding of strip malls and retail land, and that causes a glut, which becomes obvious only three quarters of a century later. We'll see how that has to manifest and how we need some enlightened leadership to create a soft landing for all involved because you can't have that much dead capital as well as non-used land under these circumstances because then what you're gonna have is tent cities and homeless people actually taking up residence on that land. So we go to another chart pretty related and this chart ends in 2016 but it's also from the economist and their source was green street advisors retail floor space only falls some years after sales fall so department stores in the united states already saw a 30 percent decline and i'll have to dig up how much has declined after this point but it had already fallen 30 percent as of 2016 and the floor space was only starting to consolidate. Now we're seeing more and more consolidation because as the years pass, the retail floor space downsizing has to occur just to match retail sales volume. So this is already evidence of a correction of what we have seen in the prior chart. The US has devoted far too much land to retail real estate. That is a very obsolete thing and a very distinct misallocation of resources and technology always corrects a misallocation of resources, sometimes by adapting around it, sometimes by toppling the cause of the misallocation head on. And there are a lot of examples of this on this channel, such as taxi medallions, which I talk about over here in this video, as well as oil, OPEC, which I talk about in this video over here. Oil can briefly rise in price because of geopolitical events, but unless the government actually deliberately stops technology from finding new supply of oil, which is what has happened in the United States, the downward price trend is very distinct in oil because of technology enabling greater and greater discovery and lower and lower break-even costs. So the same is true now for retail floor space. So this is happening. And this brings us to the fourth chart that I want to show. Now this fourth chart I have also discussed in other videos on this channel, such as this one up here. The zoning tax is a very overlooked aspect of life in America because there are some cities where housing is quite literally five times more expensive than it needs to be because of very, very lopsided zoning against the construction of housing and in favor of the construction of retail real estate, office real estate, which is also in glut as I describe in this video over here, and other uses that are designed to preclude the construction of residential real estate. Now e-commerce is freeing up this land so they can either make housing, which is the only type of real estate that is still in demand, or they can let that be unused derelict land for a long time and it'll be unsightly. And that is something that technological forces will wash over because there's some cities that will not be affected because they didn't artificially constrain the supply of housing construction, such as Dallas, Columbus, Minneapolis, and so forth. Then you have the extreme outliers, San Francisco, I mean, a house may be $5 million over there, but under a free market of construction and zoning, it would be only one fifth of that price. So $1 million. And that gets closer to something that kind of makes sense, I would say. Los Angeles, the same thing. Something that is 3.8 million in Los Angeles should only be about 1 million. And even New York City is not as bad as San Francisco or Los Angeles. And then the other cities are relatively not that bad. Even San Jose, I question whether this is right. San Jose does have restrictions that are almost as bad as San Francisco's, but fine, we go with this chart as it is. This is somewhat of a problem, but it's still sane. It's not ridiculous. And then you have much better cities over here. So you have this retail gale of creative destruction going on, all this land being freed up. And now you have the Zoom telework revolution. If some very anti-construction Bay Area city, such as Palo Alto or Los Altos or Saratoga, where I live, is one that wants no new housing constructed, fine, they were able to create that type of restriction of new supply creation for a long time, but under the Zoom revolution, they have to compete with new supply that might be 15, 20, 25, 50, 100, or even 500 miles away, because someone might move out of one of these cities and live where the cost of living is one third as much, 
because they can still do their job over Zoom. And that fluidity is very good and necessary and very much synchronous with the first principles of technology and economics that I describe in the Atom publication. If Palo Alto says we will not construct any new houses at all, okay, the person who's paying $5,000 a month for an apartment in Palo Alto can go to Fremont, which is only 15 miles away, but the rent might be half. Or they can go over to Stockton, where the rent might be one-fourth, or just cross state lines and live in Nevada, where they save state income tax on top of having low rent as well. And this balloon is already puncturing. Very few people realize it. There's going to be a downward pricing in the real estate of many parts of these cities. The most prime areas are more resistant because those are full of people who are so wealthy that they don't really care about the real estate price. But anything other than the absolute top tier, and I mean Palo Alto just walking distance from University Avenue, not all of Palo Alto and certainly not Mountain View or anything like that, or the prime part of San Francisco like Billionaire's Row or Pacific Heights, or perhaps only the very best parts of Los Angeles. Only those are going to be resistant because those are full of people whose net worth is much higher higher than the price of their house. But outside of those small niches amounting to only hundreds or at most a thousand or two homes per metro area, everything else is super vulnerable in the Zoom telework age and the combined technological force of retail land being rendered permanently obsolete and having to be repurposed into something else when the only thing it can be repurposed to is in fact housing because office space is also in a permanent glut as I just described. So these four charts tell a story, and many of you will be able to piece together the story that I've narrated from these four charts. For those of you who found the dot connecting to be a little difficult, you may want to see this video again and consider the implications of what has been displayed by these four charts. The retail apocalypse is a good thing and a necessary technological upgrade, but the telework revolution is very, very complementary because housing is ultimately a commodity and a commodity has to be net deflationary in price. If gold and oil are far below their record high in price and are not really rising, then a wooden box that is just constructed in a way that human beings can live in it is not some exclusive ultra special thing. It is also a commodity of sorts. And the economics of technology will eventually prove that to be the case, as we shall soon see. Anyway, I hope you found this informative and I encourage you to upvote this video and hit that notification bell as well as subscribe to this channel if you have not already. Thank you very much for watching.